All right, well, good morning, everyone. I think we're going to get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have a very informative workshop for you with a special guest as well, so you, you can ask questions away. So we're going to start and talk about senior living options, and then I'm going to introduce you to Dave Bailey. So I'm going to share my screen, and then we will jump right in. Okay, let me know that you can see everything I'm seeing. Okay. Yes, it looks good. All right, perfect. So just a quick reminder, you are welcome to jump in as we are going through the workshop and discussing different topics, or if you are welcome to use your chat button, which is in the middle of your black bar at the bottom of the Zoom screen. So welcome everyone. My name is Olga St. Pierre. I am a real estate agent and a senior living specialist with Keller Williams Real Estate. And uh, today we are talking about the first workshop in our senior series where we are discussing senior living options. This is an overview workshop where we're going to touch, up, to touch upon what are some of the uh, options that you have that you uh, can consider depending on what your planning process is. So just a little bit about me and my team. We are focused on serving our clients with all of their real estate needs and moves in New Jersey and Pennsylvania for the last 13 years. Uh, we do this full time and we truly are passionate and I truly love what I do. Our team mission is to help anyone with a, a dream of owning a home. And once you are a homeowner, depending on where you are in your life cycle, we support you by helping you being a sustainable and responsible homeowner. We do provide a, um, a free service of helping move anyone in United States and Canada. We have a state-of-the-art relocation service for you. As you know, making a move is one of life's top 10 stressors. People just don't realize how much stuff they accumulate over the years. And our concert service is here for you. It is absolutely free and no cost to you. If you are looking for contractors in this time of the year, we are working on our income taxes. If you need some help of professionals and recommendations, our concierge service is your virtual yellow pages from A to Z. So if we can help you with any recommendations, it is absolutely free to you. Um, we just want to be there to help you make your decision. So that's a little bit about us. And let's jump right in. And um, here's the plan for this morning. We are talking about the why, considering different retirement options, some of the questions to ask yourself that I think are important, uh, different types of retirement living uh, options, and I have some thoughts and suggestions for you on what's next, all right? So the truth about staying in your home, and I hear this quite often when we are working with our senior clients, so I just wanted to bring some of these kind of questions and thoughts to your attention. And before I do that, what I do suggest that you do is uh, some of you that have been on my workshops many times know that I am a big believer in notebooks, right? I have, I have one actually here with me if I need to take down notes. And if you are in the process or if you're, if you're helping a loved one or you're doing this for yourself, I do recommend that you grab a, a notepad or notebook to jot down your thoughts and jot down some of your questions or whatever it is that's on your mind that pertains to you downsizing or making a move or thinking about where you're going to go next. It has been proven scientifically that it, it also going to help you in your brain and your sanity, I think from my own personal experience is where you take everything that you think about, some of your thoughts and concerns, and if you jot them down, it gives your brain a peace of mind knowing that it does not have to expand energy on making sure that it doesn't forget these things. When you put them down on paper, it's going to stay on there forever. So your brain is going to kind of relax and help you uh, deal with it and process it better. So that is my recommendation to you. So let's talk about some of these truths and some of the thoughts that I wanted to bring to your attention. So my current home will be the best possible place for me to live in my post-retirement years. Well, the one thing that I want you to think about is when you bought the home that you're in, 
at that time, perhaps you were starting a family and you really wanted to have a big yard for the kids to play in. You wanted to have a basement to store all your things or maybe basement was going to be finished. So overall, your ideal home does evolve throughout your lifetime. And as the kids grow, as things change right now, your kids probably have their own homes, right? So what is important to you right now is probably not the same thing that was important to you back when you moved into your home, right? So right now, it could be the steps to the second floor that are starting to be hard and challenging. If your laundry is in the basement, that's probably challenging as well. And that yard that was amazing a few years ago, now it's just overwhelming to take care of. So think about the home that you're in and how is that is it really helping you or is it now becoming a hindrance because it's not ideal for where you are today? My current home is the best option to continue an active social life and for me to stay connected with my friends in the years ahead. And I don't blame you for thinking that way. However, you may want to have a conversation with your friends to see what their plans are, right? Maybe some of them are having health issues and then they may be forced to move into, you know, maybe with their kids or consider living in a retirement facility. So a lot of the times, if you think that your friends are of the same state of mind, it may not be the best kind of, you know, thinking because you don't know what their situation is. So if this is important to you and considering where your friends are because you want to stay close to your circle, ask them, hey, what are you thinking about doing? Are you thinking about making a move? What does that look like to you? I have a couple of clients right now that are trying to decide whether they want to stay in Pennsylvania or maybe they may want to go to New Jersey, but they're trying to find that central location because having access and being close to their friends is very important to them, okay? It's less expensive and more financially secure for me to stay in my current home. And I completely understand how a lot of people think this way. But what I also want you to think about is that it's not just about the mortgage that you had on your home. You also have monthly expenses to maintain your home. And as you age through your life journey, your home ages as well. So I want you to think about in the place that you're in, and I want you to think about the most important things in your home, the most expensive things in your home. How old are they? So I'm asking you to jot down the age of your roof the age of your heating and air conditioning system. I just had to put a new system in myself so I know exactly how much that costs. The age of your windows. If you're having any issues in your basement, what about your siding, right? Those things don't last forever. And when you do have to have the expense of replacing those items, you can't spread it out like a mortgage over a number of years. A lot of the times it's a deposit and then you know split 50-50. And those things are even more expensive now, especially uh, with COVID, where the cost of labor and the cost of materials has increased substantially. And there's actually a shortage of materials as well. So I want you to think about those things and just sit down. And also with potential uh, caring costs, if you're thinking about getting some care in your home for your you know, personal care or um, health care, it may actually be the most expensive option because of all the things that need to be considered. It could be easy to get any care that I need at home. And that kind of you know, flows in from my last point where it, it's not just one nurse or one item. You are talking about having a team of people and coordinating your care and making sure that everything is taken care of. So it could be overwhelming for you. And you know, when you're looking for that care and you're hoping that someone is going to plan it for you, it's very challenging to do that from your home. So just think about those things as well. So if you are considering staying at home, which is aging at home is the general term for it, and you're committed to doing that, okay, here are some things for you to consider, okay? Is your home safe? That should be your number one concern because falls are the leading cause of death for seniors who are 65 and over. So I actually have a home safety assessment that I am happy to send to you. It's just a memory jogger and it goes through everything that is inside and outside of your home to make sure that your home is a safe place for you. And if there's some modifications that may be needed, are we talking about getting an estimates from contractors? Uh, you know, is this going to be, is it going to make sense for you to do, 
I think is where you would need to make a decision, okay? Are you going to have access to healthcare and your personal care? And yes, those are the important questions that you need to ask yourself, right? Is this something that I'm going to need now or maybe I'm going to need a couple of years down the road? And it's not fun to think about, but these are all important considerations. Financial resources to fund your living. Are we talking about Medicare coverage, requirements to meet, physician-created care plan, private insurance, you own funds? You need to really have a good understanding of your financial resources and how long are they going to last you? These are tough questions that you truly do need to ask yourself because nobody is going to do the planning and take care of you better than you because you know your situation the best. Access to transportation, of course, access to social interaction. Social interaction is extremely important. And as we mentioned before, if your friends are moving into assisted living and you're not, if you may not be able to drive anymore or that's coming up, how are you going to get your social interaction? So let's talk about considering retirement living. If we are exploring all different options, whether we are deciding that we're going to stay at home or we're going to go into a, some kind of a facility, here are a couple of questions that I want you to ask yourself. And everyone that is on this workshop that signed up is going to get a copy of this, um, of this uh, booklet. So that way you can then take these questions and I want you to take the time and actually answer all of them and ask yourself and your loved ones honestly, on what these questions bring to you. Is this now opening up a discussion? And really give it some thought. So here are your senior living options. I wanted to have some kind of a general overview. Um, this is, you know, if I said to myself, okay, if I was going to help my parents on figuring out what are the best options and what are the amenities that are offered by each uh, type of community, here's what I would be looking at. And you can see that, you know, depending on what your current goals are and maybe what your goals are that are coming up, you can kind of get an idea. I think it's almost like a bird's eye view all in one page that I find very helpful. You know, so the least expensive options are going to be your independent living. living and if you're going to be staying at home, your adult daycare. So those are the uh, places where you can have some social interaction, get something to eat, maybe have a uh, field trip with others and just enjoy yourself. Here's another great graph that I really like. It also gives you an idea, you know, that really is the reality check on the cost of some of these senior living communities. The most expensive ones are going to be your memory care communities because you do need 24 hour care there, your nursing homes and end of life support as well. All right, so let's just run through and talk about uh, what some of these communities do have. Independent living, this is where we're starting out with the most flexibility, where you have the most independence. Um, they're also called adult, uh, active adult communities. There are lots of different options where you can rent an apartment if you don't wanna buy something. There's condos, there's single families that you can purchase and they are filled with amenities and they are fun, right? There's lots of things to do. There's lots of entertainment and most important thing I think for many seniors to consider is that the landscaping and snow, everything is maintained. And in some areas, even the exterior maintenance is also covered in your monthly homeowners association fees. Some of the independent communities can be also part of a continuing care retirement community. And the best way to kind of think about the continuing care place is a campus. It's like almost like a college campus where you have different schools, right? You have school of business, maybe school of education. So each uh, each section, like independent living section, is that one school that I'm mentioning to you. So whenever you decide to consider different communities, I strongly encourage you to bring some kind of checklist with you when you are touring. So that way you can get all of your important, most important questions answered. And we have a checklist for you for every single type of community for you to check out. Assisted living is uh, communities for individuals who may need assistance right now or sometime down the road, right? That's activities of daily living and also, you know, whether it's personal care or it's health care. And um, there's, it's a little bit more help. Think of it this way. So some of the services that are offered are dining, supervision, security, and transportation. And um, it's a senior friendly design. So that way, if you do have a walker or wheelchair, it's easy for you to navigate so that way you feel safe. 
Continuing care campuses, that, this is what I mentioned to you. Uh, these are the most comprehensive and one of the most expensive options, and they do offer lots of different options. So it's important to visit a couple of them to compare and to see what makes sense for you for personal reasons, for health reasons, as well as for financial reasons, right? Because you may not be able to afford one or the other. So it's important to understand, like, a, you know, it's a big umbrella. Is this going to be a good fit for you? So long-term contracts are offered and they guarantee you lifelong shelter. So that way, if right now you may not need any personal or health care, you can start in the independent living right on that campus. And then as you need to, you can transfer and transition into a, a higher level of assistance if you need to. But the good thing is, is that you're, it's all in one place. The help is there and they will help you with that transition. So there's different levels of care that are available. Some of these also offer, offer you like a la carte or some kind of like membership type uh, options. So it's definitely important for you to just take a look and see what each community does offer, right? And of course, there's always interaction. There's flexible dining venues, housekeeping, interior, exterior maintenance, and they also have different healthcare choices as well. So. So when you are thinking about what are some of the best options, and that goes back to uh, me mentioning to you, does it make sense for you to stay at home versus going to the community? I encourage you to use this budget sheet. It's very, very simple, but it's just making sure that it covers everything. And I want you to take this and think about what are some of your expenses that are going you're going to have at home if you decide that you want to stay at home and live your golden years at home, or you may want to, to uh, become part of the community. I am happy to send this to you so that way you can take a look and see what makes sense the most to you, right? With continuing care communities, there's often an entrance fee that's involved that can be quite substantial. And then there's also monthly service fees, right? So think of that as like almost like a rent option for you that you pay on a monthly basis. Nursing and rehabilitation communities, um, they are for individuals who are sometimes too sick and too frail to live at home to care for themselves. And a lot of the times these can be temporary stays, maybe for someone who just got out of the hospital and they need maybe a few weeks to a month of rehab care to kind of get back on their feet. Or some people end up staying there because they truly do need 24 hour care, okay? Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance, and personal assets are used under various circumstances to pay for those services. That's why it's extremely important for you to have a very clear picture if it's for you or your family member who is helping your, your loved one to kind of figure things out. It's very important to know what your financial health is so that way you can understand what you can afford and how much, how long those funds are going to last you as well. Sit down and have a honest conversation with your loved ones. This is a very, very important item. And I suggest that you do this as early as possible in your journey when you're trying to make the, the best decision for yourself. It's critically important to have a clear communication. And here are some of the items that I am encouraging you to consider in these conversations. Number one, you need to be brutally honest with your loved ones that you're going to rely on or ask for their help and it's perfectly okay to ask for someone's help, okay? And also, when we are dealing with various family members, they will appreciate the fact that you're asking for their help or you're sharing with them what you're feeling, so that way they know how to help you better. Uh, where to find important documents? This is a huge uh, and very, very important thing. You know, do you have a healthcare directive? Do you have a will? List of all of your accounts. How do you get access to those accounts? Where are they located? Which banks? Is it a brokerage account? You know, what kind of insurance do you have? Do you have all those things in one place or a direction of where those items can be found? If you are not able to make decisions for yourself, who is going to be in charge and helping and be uh, responsible to make your decisions, right? That would be someone like a power of attorney. If you have more than one child and you want maybe an oldest child to be this person, make sure you have a conversation with them to make sure that they're comfortable in doing that. Some people are not, they can easily get overwhelmed and they're afraid maybe they're not going to make the right decision. So have a conversation and make sure that this person in charge is going to really be feeling truly comfortable taking care of things for you. And of course, who is your team? 
your attorney, your financial advisor, your accountant, and to make sure that they know who your loved ones who are going to be helping you in this journey or maybe helping you when you're not able to make decisions for yourself. And also, what are your wishes? And this is a very difficult conversation to have. However, think of those things where, you know, if you are on life support, do you want to continue to be on life support or do you give your family permission to take you off after a certain period of time? You need to think about those things to help your family make the right decision so that way they know your wishes. And this also is another uh, question that will come up is, um, you know, uh, organ donor. Is this something that you want your family to consider or you're against it? And unless you tell them and share with them what your feelings are, they're not going to know what is important to you. And so that way they know how to make the best decisions for you. Ways to live with purpose and stay active. I think it's extremely important. Uh, you know, when you have had a full and fulfilling life and you know that there are certain things that are important to you, don't think that once you retire and you head into these communities, none of those things matter anymore. So I want you to kind of think about and see what is that fire in your belly? What is your passion? What are your hobbies, right? Do you want to learn to do something new, right? ceramics? Do you want to play a new instrument? Do you want to learn a new, another language? And I always say, why not? Why won't you, right? Nothing, nothing is saying that just because you're older, you can't go back to school and do something fun. Or maybe you want to make a difference and have leave an impact and volunteer, or you can, you know, you want to start a new group. I have a, a client who bought a home in a small 55 plus community and she likes to walk. So she created a walking group. So they walk twice or three times a week in the mornings or at night. And it gives her a whole sense of purpose because she's in charge. So think about what's important to you and think about how you are going to make a difference, still stay active and enjoy some of your favorite things. So at this point, I'm going to stop this for just for now, and I wanted to introduce you to Dave Bailey. Dave, uh, just introduce yourself and tell us which community that you're with, and then we can go from there and just kind of ask you what's what's been new in your community as well. We have it's been a little while since we talked last. It sure has been. Thank you for having me. I'll go once again. My name is Dave Bailey. I am the community sales director at Brightview Senior Living an assisted living community here in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. Perfect, perfect. Uh, what kind of community is it? Is it continuing care or what, what kind of campus, what does that look like in your community? Brightview Mount Laurel is an assisted living community with a total of 100 residents. 65 of those residents reside in traditional assisted living. 35 of those residents are in a memory care neighborhood, all here in one building, two separate areas of the community. We are a month to month rental property. And I will say that probably 95% of the people who move into Brightview Mount Laurel, this will be the last place that they will call home. Based on what you heard, I just wanna make sure that I covered everything in terms of the decision-making process, but I also wanted to pick your brain from you being the professional, because you see this every day, what other important considerations may, may, member, may be for family members is important to, to do or prepare and help their loved ones? So putting a value on, on things sometimes helps. So we all have pride in our home ownership, um, as we should. But there comes a time where, as Olga had stated, our priorities change. Um, maybe going down and working in my woodworking shop in the basement really hasn't been my priority for the past 10 years. And I spent more time staying on the first floor and maybe going out to dinner with friends or maybe even going upstairs to the bedroom isn't a priority for me anymore. And I really find myself just living on one floor in two or three rooms because it's convenient. Yet, my goal has always been to, to die in my own home and never to have to leave this home. But what's the value of that basement to me today? What value can I place on having that basement versus if I should fall, having someone nearby to help pick me up 
or to call 911 so I can get help within the next 10 minutes rather than somebody waiting a day and a half to find me. It's hard to put a value on that, but those are the things that, that we look at as we manage our life going forward. Sometimes a difficult situation to face, um, but I think we all know when we make a plan, because my plan is I'm just going to go to sleep one night and I'm not going to wake up. And most of us would agree we call that a beautiful death. That doesn't happen so often. 15% of us will have a tragedy at the home and die in a hospital. There's another 10% that will die in a rehab because by the time we had the accident, we were not strong enough to recover. So those are things that we look out for in how much help do we need around us today? When's the right time to make the move? Most people will make this move. And I, I'll tell you that I'll probably be guilty of this. We're gonna make this move after the first tragedy has happened. And then we realize that we're not invincible. My best customers that come into this community that are ready to make this move are the people who left their family home 25 years ago, moved into the 55 plus communities because they saw as their life changed, they had different values now in what was important to them. The five bedroom house didn't serve them. What's going to serve them now is that they have a community closer to them with engagement of other, other residents and, and people like them. And if you've ever talked to someone who's lived in a 55 plus community at the age of 80, they'll even tell you that they have aged out of that community. All of these new young people coming in have different ideas of what to do in that community. And most of their friends have either left to move closer to their families or have moved into uh, an assisted living community. So they struggle to hold on to their independence within that community. And then they reevaluate what their next step is going to be in a place where they still have people who might have some of the same challenges that they have that, um, you know, instead of planning a whole day of going into Philadelphia, going out to lunch, going to the flower show, then going to the theater at night, we just do one of those things because we're at a slower pace. But if you're in that, that 55 to 60 range, you want to do it all in that day. So you find your, your tribe, you find when the right time to make that move is, and then you start to explore. That's a really good description. I think that what I'm finding with a lot of my clients is they don't think that it can happen to them. And, you know, sometimes it takes that one fall for them to completely have to force to be reassessed the situation. And most people, I don't think they plan ahead. Is that has been your experience too with seeing with your, with the new residents that are coming in planning wise? Because I work in an assisted living, most of the people that come to me have had that tragedy. They have had some time in rehab and they realize now they have to reevaluate what's going to be important to them. That is the case for assisted living. For independent living, it's a little bit different. Independent living, you typically will find someone who has decided that they just can't keep up with all of the maintenance, the housework, and they'll start to explore independent living. And what a lot, a lot of people will usually ask, and you know, a big question on everyone's mind is what is the cost of making that move into independent living or assisted living? So the range is just like if you're buying a car. There is value in every vehicle that you will buy, but sometimes if you spend the $15,000 on a new car, you don't have all of the assistive devices that you are going to have if you're buying the $45,000 Mercedes. So the range is, is very different. It has to do with quality. It has to do with staffing. It has to do with amenities. Um, there's a community in Woodbury, New Jersey that's an independent living community. 
that you can move into a studio apartment there for about $2,500 a month. They're going to provide two meals a day for you. They are going to provide your shelter and maintaining the building. Now, I can't tell you that all of the light bulbs are, are going to be on as you walk down that hallway. And maybe for dinner one night, you're having a sandwich and uh, chips that come out of uh, a bag. But for $2,500, you might feel comfortable enough to know that you don't have to shovel a sidewalk and you don't have to worry about the water heater or, or paying that electric bill. On the other hand, there are other communities that are over $6,000 a month. And in those communities, you can be sure that the carpeting that you're walking on has probably been changed within the last four years. There's never a light bulb out in the hallway. They have a whole house generator that if they lose power, that's gonna come right back on. And when you go to the dining room, it's food that you wanna eat because you went to a food council to talk to the chef about the types of food that you were expecting for the amount of investment that you're making. So it's very wide and varied. Assisted living, depending upon how much help you have and the quality of the building, typically can range from $4,000 a month to $12,000 a month. Again, depending upon the amenities that you're looking for. Do you want the concierge service where there's a town car at your beck and call at all times? That if you want to go and uh, take a ride to, to your pharmacy or to pick up your own dry cleaning, have somebody do that for you? That exists or the communities where the walk might be a little bit longer. Maybe this was a nursing home 40 years ago that they morphed into what they call an assisted living and there's no carpeting on the floor. Those places exist as well. But what you're valuing there is the type of care that you're going to receive and a sense of community and having people there to help you with your activities of daily living. And Olga mentioned that before. So when you hear somebody say the activities of daily living, that means bathing, dressing, food preparation, medication management, helping somebody simply to, to get you into a restroom. And you know, sometimes our knees don't work so well. It might even be somebody to help us get up or should we have an accident to help clean us up? So again, when that time comes, our values change. Also, as probably many of you know, whether it was yourself or your parents, our modesty changes as well. We're happy to have people come to help us. Doesn't matter if they're male or female. These are people who are caring, who understand um, what the human need is, and you're happy to, to receive that help when you need it so you can still enjoy a vibrant life and a great day. Don't don't let that five or 10 minutes of your day rule your entire life. First of all, you're not alone. There's many of us who will have these challenges. And then you put yourself in a group of people who have the same challenges and you still get on that bus and you go to the Philadelphia Flower Show together. Don't let that stop you. Can you also talk a little bit about the price ranges for memory care? Because that's probably the mo most important, most expensive uh, investment because of the care. Uh, it is. So memory care, um, again, is wide and varied. You can find communities at $5,500 a month and communities at $14,000 a month. But memory care, something which I hope none of us will ever need, but probably many of us, have dealt with someone in our family that we just didn't know how to help. So there are communities that engage residents in different levels of where they are. The most important thing that I can ever share with someone about dealing with someone who has some form of dementia, whether that's Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's, or they're hallucinating, they've had vascular dementia, slightly different in each one of those cases. But what's all the same is that you have to join their journey. 
when Helen comes to me and she says, Dave, remember when we were children and we used to go pick up seashells uh, down on Long Beach Island? Helen, who is 90 years old, who would never be my contemporary, who I didn't meet until four years ago when I came here, I say to Helen, and you know, my favorite shells were the scalloped shells. And then that takes us right into talking about scallops and talking about seafood. So I don't correct Helen, I join her journey. And then I redirect her to something that we can both talk about that we both love. And that creates a great visit. Even in a memory care neighborhood, you will have residents who are at their beginning stages and residents who were at their end stages. What's important to know is when you go to see one of these communities is that you see all of that. Because if you only see the people who were at the beginning stages, what did they do with the people five years in? Is this no longer their home? Did they ask them to move? So you wanna see that full spectrum and you wanna see engagement. You wanna see, you go to one side of the room and you might see somebody playing a game like Wheel of Fortune. Take a letter, put the letter in a word and put the word in a phrase. Yet on the other side of the room, you're gonna see somebody doing a rhyming game. Words that rhyme with boat. Now each set of residents can participate and feel a sense of accomplishment. And one day those people who were playing the Wheel of Fortune game are gonna move over to the other side of the room for the rhyming game. And then one day they're gonna be sitting at a table feeling different textiles and textures. And they're going to do a tactile exercise because they verbally can no longer communicate. And you wanna see that full spectrum. But memory care is designed to have someone almost watch your move 24 hours a day. You wanna look for associates who have longevity in that community, who develop relationships and can anticipate someone's needs. So when Helen sits down at a table and I ask her, would you like cranberry juice or orange juice? Cause she's always gonna get a choice. And she looks at me and can't find the right words. I say, you know what, Helen? You usually like cranberry juice. How about we start with that? And Helen nods her head, yes. So you're anticipating a lot more needs, still giving residents choices and trying to create the best day for them that you can. Just because someone has a loss of memory because they are challenged with dementia does not mean that they cannot still learn something new, love deeply like we do, you can still have a fulfilling life just on different terms. And that really depends upon the people around you, how they treat you, how they respond to you, and how they fill your day. You know what I found interesting, what you were saying about visiting all spectrums of the memory wing, you know, as you said, when, when my grandmother was in, in a um, nursing center and we had, you know, we, we looked at a couple of different options. What I noticed was that they only show you a small part and they won't let you go in some of the areas. Is that something that's typical or is that normal? Or is it, you know, maybe they said, well, you know, for the safety of residents, because it was actually in that situation where they did not show us the areas where my grandmother ended up being. And I, you know, my dad was very upset because he felt like it was misleading. So from, in most cases, it is for the benefit of the residents. When I talk about taking our residents in our memory care neighborhood to the Philadelphia Flower Show, it's only a handful of residents that can accept leaving their surroundings. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna give you a, a picture of, of who I am today. When I walk into this community, I can go upstairs, I can make a right, I can make a left, I can go to my office, I can go to the kitchen. I have about a hundred different options of places I can go and things that I can do. As I start to lose my memory, it's easier for me if I walk down a hallway and I can only go right or go left. 
sometimes working with memory care residents, opening up a closet and saying, Helen, what would you like to wear today? Helen is overwhelmed by the hundred items that are in that closet. But if I say to Helen, Helen, would you like to wear this green sweater today or the yellow sweater? Helen can make a decision. Now imagine you're in an environment where you've been living with the same 25 people for the past year, with the same people who are caring for you. And now a door opens up and here comes a tour of five people that I've never seen before who are very loud, who are not engaging with me. And I start to feel threatened in that environment. Sometimes it is best to allow those people to have their sense of security without having visitors come in. There are days here when I will tour people through my memory care community. And because the residents know me so well here, I know them by name, I introduce my friends to them. And there are some people that I cannot engage with because they're uncomfortable with that confrontation. And there are other people that are always looking to make a new friend. So it will always depend upon the people, the individual, no two people are alike, but you have to know your, your community and the people around you. It's not a bait and switch. It's really for the safety of the residents that are there. See, they don't explain it like this. <laughs> We're just having some kind of, you know, common sex explanation as to, you know, it's for the safety. Well, what do you mean by the safety? We're not doing anything to the people, but I understand what you're talking about now. I'll give you another example. This is, um, this is sometimes even deeper into to memory care. Some communities you will go to and you will see carpeting or flooring that is all the same color throughout the community and there is no change. Then one day someone gets an idea that we're gonna redesign this community and we're going to have different areas and the blue carpeting is gonna have a nice big black border and then it's gonna to change to yellow carpeting. And a resident will walk to the edge of the blue carpeting and they'll see that black border and to them it looks like a hole. And should they go over to the yellow side, they feel as though they've left their home. Not all communities are designed that way. Some will have that constant pattern, again, to make those residents feel more comfortable as they maneuver through the community. If I may, um, Olga, when we start to look at CCRC communities, mm -hmm. which are your continuing care, continuing care retirement community, you are looking at a place where most people believe as they move in, they have this big umbrella covering them and they can move through all of these areas um, at their own pace. A CCRC is set up a little bit differently when it comes to the financial aspect of it. In a standalone assisted living, and I'll even go back to a standalone independent living community, many times you will go to an independent living community and you will find that 25% or more of the residents there probably should be in assisted living. But they've chosen to be in independent living and now they bring home care into their independent living property. Because again, they're comfortable in this home. This is where they wanna stay. So they bring services in and essentially they become a prisoner of their own little home by bringing these services in and they don't get to enjoy the rest of the independent living community because they're not at that same level. Now you go to a community where there's independent and assisted living. When the community starts to see that you have a need, they're gonna to start to introduce you to the assisted living. So you can still have all of the same friends, just make this move where you can have all of these services in house. Now, if you're in the independent living and you fall, you better be able to call 911 on your own. If you're in the independent living with the assisted living, not a nurse, not someone can come over to help you up off the floor. You still have to figure out how to get help from 911. In a CCRC, the Continuing Care Retirement Community, 
when you're in assisted living, and sometimes if you need help with three or more of your activities of daily living, they're ready to move you on to the skilled nursing center. Now, if you're living in an assisted living and need more help, they'll bring more help in for you. An independent assisted living will want to retain you there for as long as possible, bringing in as many services as they can to keep you in that community that is your home as long as it's safe. And typically the time when someone would have to move from an assisted living community is if they are bed bound for 14 days or more and not receiving hospice services, if they are a danger to themselves or to other residents. And a danger to yourself might mean I've decided not to take any of my medication anymore. And the medication that I used to take for my anxiety has me running into every resident's apartment and telling them that there's a fire in the building. I have the right to refuse medication, but how that refusal of medication will cause me to react might cause me to be asked to leave this community. If I have bed sores on my body that are not healing, I can receive better health care in a skilled nursing center. Then assisted living isn't the right place for me. If I need to be tube fed, I might not be able to live in assisted living. Now, if I may just uh, talk for a moment. Well, I can't see uh, any of your, your pictures except for, for Joyce up there. I'm going to tell you something about tube feeding. And I'm gonna tell you from a 35 year old's perspective and then from me, a 60 year old's perspective who has lived a little bit longer and has seen a lot more. At the age of 35, if someone said to me, would you like life-sustaining measures to be tube-fed? I would say no. I don't want any extraordinary measures. If somebody needs to tube-feed me, please, no, not at all. And now I'm 60 years old. And I've seen people who have had a stroke where their larynx and their throat collapses temporarily and they need to be tube fed while they're getting therapy to open up that space once again. So the tube feeding might only be for three months and then I can swallow on my own again. Tube feeding is something that we've seen residents here need for a short period of time. While we cannot do it here in assisted living, they might go out to a rehab for a period of time and then come back after the tube is removed. I just mentioned that because as you look at what your living wills might be, your advanced directives, know that your advanced directives and living wills can be changed at any time, as long as you are of sound mind and can still make decisions for yourself, you can change those at the snap of a finger. So that's a little bit about moving through uh, a CCRC and being in an independent assisted living uh, where there is no next place for you to move to. The assisted living will hold on to you for the longest period of time that they can bring in more services for you. The same thing in independent living, except you're bringing those services in yourself. You know, this is, this is great to get an, a, a real life perspective, you know, from, from a professional. Does anybody have any questions for Dave? maybe that something wasn't answered. You are welcome to put them in the chat or unmute yourselves. I think one of the biggest uh, important considerations is the financial aspect. I think that, you know, what happens, right? Let's talk about worst case scenario. What happens when the finances run out uh -huh. when that pension is depleted, right? Sure. And there's not enough money, then what's then? Well, first of all, nobody ever thinks of a pension being depleted, God forbid. But certainly those of us who have a 401k, there's only so much money there that's going to last for so long. And Social Security, uh, I can tell you that I'm 60 years old and I'm happy to say that Social Security is still there. 
I remember when I was 40, there was uh, the idea that it's not going to be there when we get older. So far, I think we're, we're okay, at least uh, today. We still have social security. When somebody moves into an assisted living community, and let's say the, the average rate is $6,000 a month, I typically have um, some social security that might be about $2,000 a month. And if you have a pension, and luckily I'm still working with people who do have pensions, um, certainly in my lifetime, Olga's lifetime, uh, Jessica's, you know, we're in a, a different position where you don't have the longevity with the company that provided a pension for you. They just tell you to put your money in your 401k. So you have some savings. Let's say you have savings of about $200,000. $200, you have a pension of maybe 2000 a month. So I have a home that I'm going to sell. And again, you know, I work with people, their home is worth 80,000 or their home is worth 350,000. Let's say we get about 180,000 from the sale of the home. I know that my monthly income is bringing in 4,000 a month. And then I have to make up that other 2,000. So at the end of a year, I'm looking at 24,000. And all of my savings in total, after the sale of my home, and the money that I have saved is about 400,000. I know at the age of 85, when I make this move, I'm never gonna run out of money. But should I run out of money? Should that day come? Should those numbers not add up for us? There is something called Medicaid here in the state of New Jersey that will allow you to live in assisted living on this program. In an assisted living community, or even in a skilled nursing center, you can go on to Medicaid and they will provide all of your care for you, your three meals a day, and take care of you to the best of their ability, just as though you had been paying privately. Medicaid is typically offered in an assisted living community after someone has resided there for two years. And there's a limited number of people that can be on that program at one time. So each community might only have 10 spots for someone. You will also move into the most affordable accommodation. So that two room apartment that you first looked at when you got to that community is not the place where you're gonna to continue to live. You might be moved to a studio apartment where you're sharing with someone else, sharing a bathroom and a kitchenette. But at that point, you've been there for two years. The community has served you well. You've enjoyed the food. You've made friendships there. And what you realize is that I really don't go back to my apartment except to sleep. If I can still have the same friends, the same care and the same great food, the small sleeping accommodation it isn't really that much of a deal breaker. I'll take that to continue to live here with all of these people and to continue to have the same great care. So Medicaid is offered for many of our residents. It just depends upon the timing of making sure that you're there for two years, you've depleted all of your finances. And I know this is hard to, to say and to think about. So some of us might have $500,000 in the bank, we sell our home. And then I go to an assisted living community and they tell me it's gonna be $8,000 a month. And I said, wait a minute, I worked very hard for this money. You mean I have to give it all away? Aren't some of these people here on Medicaid? I wanna get on Medicaid. So I'm gonna take this $500,000 and I'm gonna give it to my family. And then Medicaid comes and they say, well, what did you do with all that money you had? They do a five-year look back and you say, well, I didn't want to have to pay somebody to take care of me. I gave it to my family. And then Medicaid says, go get the money back or let your family take care of you. So unfortunately, 
The only winning situation is when you find the right community and the right people to care for you and you spend that money wisely. Hopefully none of us on this call will ever need an assisted living or need a nursing home. We all have the same plan. We go to sleep one night, it's a beautiful death. Well, God laughs at those plans and, uh, and throws other things our way. So the best advice that I can give any of you is to explore and to understand. The picture that you see behind me is my community. And this does not look like a nursing home. It looks like a hotel. When you come in with a concierge service and people have apartments here, not rooms. Um, you'll have our chef here at this community is phenomenal. He's an Italian chef, Anthony Di Pasquale. And the pizzas that he makes here on Friday for lunch, I'll put up against any pizzeria here in this area. So test the food if you go to visit, see the apartment, talk to the residents that are there. Whether you're going to look at independent living, a CCRC, or an assisted living community, talk to the residents that are there, talk to the staff, see if they like it there. I can guarantee you that if the staff isn't happy, the residents aren't happy. That's the best advice that I can give you. And just so you know, when people come into the community, just like Olga said, we give them a journal for them to take notes and write down not only what they, they see here today that's important. So I asked them to use the journal in two ways. One way you write down what you've learned and then you go to the back of the book and then write down your questions that you're gonna ask me the next time we talk. So always have a book with you. And if a community provides it to you, take it. Oh, this is so awesome. Maybe I will see you at your next event that just got sent to me. I'll have to take a look at my schedule. Very good. I hope to see you on uh, March 15th. Now, if I have any seniors that are on this call on March 10th here in Mount Laurel, there's a little bagel shop called Victoria's Bagels. And if you're in New Jersey and you've ever seen this coffee news, you can see right here on March 10th from eight o'clock until 1030, we are giving free bagels and coffee away. Just come to Victoria's, say, hi, Dave, I'm here for my free bagel. And uh, we're handing out bagels and coffee. That's wonderful. And you're helping out a local business too. So that's- We are, we're keeping it the very point. local. You know, we could have gone to like one of those big conglomerates like Panera. Mm -hmm. No, we wanted to keep it local. So, oh. Olga, thank you so much for having me today. Everyone who is on the call, thank you for listening. Uh, Olga will send you my uh, contact information. Absolutely. My job is to help people. You don't have to move into my community. If I can help you with a question or point you in the right direction, please utilize me as a resource. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you so much. If any other last questions, last call for questions for Dave, yes. When we forward a copy of this recording, as well as the booklet, Dave's information and information of, on his community is going to be sent as well, so that way you can reach out to him directly with any questions. Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Happy March, everyone. I hope everyone is looking forward to spring as much as I am, and we hope to see you next week in another workshop of ours. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Bye-bye. You're welcome. Bye-bye.